Good morning again. Um, we are finishing up this morning a sermon series called Reconstructing Faith. And, and based on what we've already had conversations about this morning, I could actually go sit down. It's, uh, the sermon's already been preached, but we'll work through this a little bit here. Um, really, during this series, we've been um, looking at the role of doubt and even disillusionment in the journey of faith. It's kind of been an interesting conversation. And even the fact that we can helpfully work through these kind of places in our life and uh, find hope and peace and maybe even newfound strength as we find our way to the other end of that part of the journey, right? The truth is that we sometimes encounter things in life that can shake up our faith system, right? Whether it be maybe a big tragedy in your life that, that you're just trying to reconcile how a, a good God could allow that to happen, right? That happens. Uh, maybe it's a preconceived idea, which we see in a lot of people in the Bible, that, that really they have these ideas, these preset ideas that keep them from being able to see and uh, understand what God, God's doing, what's happening. Or it really could be even the church universal and our track record as a people. We've had some um, bad characters in the church, and um, that can be disheartening to us, right, as, as church people. So, so many things can come along and just pull the rug out from under us in, in such a way. Uh, how do we go about the work of reconstructing our faith, putting our faith back together after a difficult turn, a difficult process? The struggle is real, isn't it? And I think if we think that we are immune to these seasons, I, th I think if you could say that, you'd probably be unique. <laughs> you might be the only one in history because we see in the Bible, just about every person you see in the Bible has a season of doubt. Um, we've looked at so many characters who have struggled, and it seems like really all of them. <laughs> Peter, um, obviously doubting Thomas, you got to throw in the list. The rest of the disciples, um, Elijah the prophet, John the Baptist, Moses, Abraham, Sarah, David, Prophet Jeremiah, I mean, the list just goes on and on and on and on. We've had struggles understanding what God was doing. And yet we also see in these stories a God who is patient and gracious with us as we go through these tough times, right? I think he knows a few things about us. I mean, he, he created us, right? So he understands that finite, limited human beings will at times have struggles dealing with this God who is so much bigger than us, is so much wiser than us, right? It was God who said through the prophet Isaiah, we've read this the last few weeks, Isaiah 55, verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And this really was the first tool that we talked about um, the first week, the tool bag for, for doubt, what we should have as our tool in that tool bag is go to the source. When we have a struggle or doubt, don't walk away from God. Go to him. We need more of him and not less, right? We've been talking about that. We, we need to spend more time in scripture and not less. The truth is that in this pursuit of Jesus that we can sometimes get tangled up in what I would call man-made religious systems, things that really don't represent the gospel, that don't represent the hope of Christ. And so we have to continue to work at our faith and really look at what we are thinking about and, and have to continue this pursuit of Christ. And when we struggle with that, we've got to find a way to separate the truth of Jesus from these broken systems. And this is where our second tool of our tool bag for doubt came in, especially in our world of kind of choose your own faith, right? We talked about that that week, what I called the Goldilocks age of Christianity when we get to choose what's just right for me, right? Just the right music, just the right preaching, just the right time of day for the service, just the right people, but also just the right beliefs sometimes, right? Or just the right rules that we want to follow. I mean, we kind of can hop around and pick the church that's just right for me. And so the second, second tool that's so important for us 
is to make sure our faith is built on the bedrock, the cornerstone of Jesus, right? We have so many foundational truths that have been in the church for over 2,000 years. We can rely on them. We don't have to come up with newfangled ideas uh, about God. Uh, We have them. And we've got all sorts of millions of people, actually, Christians over the years, that have found God to be faithful. And we can understand that and believe that, right? And as we talked about last week, part of the foundational truth is that God is, is still active in our world today, right? He's at work through his grace. He's offering us gifts um, that are available to us, whether we're wandering or we're right where we're supposed to be. He still offers us his grace to help us reconstruct our faith and help us to grow into who he desires us to be. We can trust in God's work in us. This is what we talked about last week. He started the work before we even knew who, who he was, what he was doing. And he's faithful to bring his work to completion as we looked at in Philippians, as we trust in him. We are not alone in this. Isn't that, isn't that good news? <laughs> when we run across hard times, we are not alone. One way to think about the life of faith is by comparing it to the sport of rock climbing. I don't know a lot about rock climbing, but I did a little Googling, and and really there's all sorts of different types of rock climbing, but most of them get lumped into two main categories. The first traditional rock climbing category is to use ropes and harnesses and what's called belays, um, which are really just things that you can attach yourself to, points that you can attach yourself to, and Um, make yourself secure so you don't fall off a cliff, right? So maybe a rock that you attach yourself to or a pen or a person, as in the picture we just saw, that was holding the tension at the bottom, um, really making sure that you're safe as you climb up the cliff. And there's another another kind of rock climbing um, that's called free soloing. You've probably heard of that before, where really you take all the safeguards off and then you get to fall down the cliff, <laughs> right? I mean, that sounds really smart. Um, so which one of these categories of rock climbing would you put Christianity in? The one with all the safety gear and the, the belays where you have the guy holding you? Well, we, we sometimes think it's free soloing, right? That we're just out there on our own. Um, everything is up to me to navigate the cliffs of, of life. But that's just not true. For a believer, God's always there. God's always on belay, right? He's always the one holding on to the rope to make sure that we can can make it up there safely, right? That's what he does. We can trust in him. And that was the third bag in our tool bag for doubt and disillusionment. We got to get away from this idea that we are better de- better off dealing with doubt or even with life, on our own. God is not some bully to be avoided. God is a good God. And he's full of mercy and grace. He loves us, right? He has a plan for our lives. That's better than any plan that we could come up with on our own. I think that's, that's unbelievable, right? I look around and I see all these people who are broken, and they think they have to make up their own plan for their life. They think they, can, they have to figure it out. They have to make every choice along the way. And they are so stressed out about it. Have you met people like that? They're so stressed because they're trying to take on the world. And by the way, there's a creator who has a plan. <laughs> that would be a lot easier to follow than you making up the way, right? I mean, they, they find themselves just feeling like they have no purpose or and they just don't know what they're missing. God loves us. He wants the best for us. And he's already at work. All we have to do is reach out to him. Knowing and trusting in God and his grace, his love for us, no matter what we've done, right? No matter what we've done. This has to be in our tool bag when we're dealing with doubt when we're going through difficult times, that that is the God that we follow, right? We've got to have that in mind. And so now we head into our fourth tool for our tool bag, 
What else do we need in that tool bag <laughs> in this journey through struggles? What are we missing? Well, for this one, I want you to turn to the book of James. Um, turn with me to James chapter 5. If you don't know anything about the book of James, it's a letter, um, super practical letter, um, filled with practical applications for our faith. Jesus emphasizes throughout the letter, or James emphasizes throughout the letter that our faith has to be lived out, right? As he says in chapter 2, faith without works is deed, is not deed, dead. Um, and lived out faith can truly impact the world. So James, super practical letter, and he gets to the end of this practical letter with some really, really, really good advice on what we're looking at. Read with me starting in James 5, verse 13. Verse 13 says, is, is anyone among you in trouble? Well, let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Give praise to God if you're happy, right? Is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Come together, pray for healing, right? Verse 15, in the prayer offered in faith, will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to who? <laughs> to each other. That's odd. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And catch that. Why do we share together? Why do we share life together? It's so we can pray for each other, right? And encourage each other. In our walk, prayer matters. Consider what Elijah did. In verse 17, it says, Elijah was a human being, just like us. Even as we are, it says, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain in the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crop. And then catch this last part, verse 19. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way, way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sin. If someone wanders from the faith in the body, show them what it's like to be welcomed back well, right? What is James describing in this passage? All of, the, all of this passage together. Well, he's talking about a community of faith, right? All these activities would be in a loving faith community, a church family. A God-focused faith community is a crucial part of our reconstruction process, of our um, growing in the Lord and being able to work through hard times, right? In fact, David Platt in his book, Exalting Jesus and James, talking about this practical book, he says the church is one of the God-ordained means God uses to keep us faithful. God is sovereign, and he does the preserver, preserving, uh, I can't read this this morning, preserving, but he does it through the church, looking out for, caring for, loving one another to keep one another from sin. This is yet another reason we ought to be involved in the lives of others in the church. <laughs> How important is the church family? That's what we've been discussing this morning, isn't it? When we're facing times of difficulty, disillusionment, especially then, right? How important is it to know that you are not alone in the journey of faith? And what do we, <laughs> what do we usually do when we find times of struggle? Honestly, I've met way more people walking away from the church when they have struggle <laughs> than actually walking to the church. Have you noticed that? At the very moment when they should be leaning into each other, sometimes we go the opposite direction. Have you, have you noticed that? Am I the only one that notices things like that? Now the truth is, in the broken world that we live in, some of the doubt and disillusionment that that we've been caused actually came from the church, didn't it? And I understand that. 
we have had some bad characters in, in the church over the last 2,000 years. Many in our world might even view the whole idea of church with skepticism because of some of those people. And that honestly saddens me. And I know that it saddens God, right? That's not what he would hope for the church. And yet still, Scripture is very clear that the church, the body of Christ, is essential in the healthy life of the believer. Essential. So I just want to encourage you this morning, if you've been burned by the church, if, you've, if you're skittish about, skittish about church, I, mean, I suggest that maybe just start the journey back with a couple of the friends that you know that you know is very sincere in their faith, right? Start with a couple that are super solid in their faith. Maybe a smaller group, right? Jesus said in Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. We honestly don't need a mega church <laughs> to find our way back to God. Sometimes it's easier um, to just find a couple friends to, to start that journey back, right? But Jesus still alludes to more than one, right? So community is still really, really important. And this is one reason why we, as a church, we emphasize small groups. And even beyond small groups, we actually emphasize smaller groups, too. I don't know if you're aware of that, but we, we call them life transformation groups. And some of you are in them, and I've never heard the name of that. So if, um, they're usually groups of three or four, or five or six, as some of my groups are in. Um, but it's important to know and trust the people that you are with on this journey of faith, isn't it? And then as you find yourself growing and gaining health, maybe you'd be better able to navigate the fact <laughs> that the church is literally a hospital for sinners. Did you know that? <laughs> Not only for sinners, but for saints too, right? We're all on this journey together. None of us have arrived. In fact, well, maybe we should take a survey on that. Have, have any of No, I'm not going to ask that question. We all need fellowship with other believers. All of us. We also need the mercy and grace of God to coexist with each other. <laughs> I didn't even get an amen for that one. I, that, was, that was a good one. So even with the risk of dealing with other broken people, we see example after example in Scripture of the importance of others in our faith. You can, again, we could start the list and we'd be here till tomorrow. Ruth and Naomi, Elijah, Elisha, David and Nathan. I mean, you could just keep going on down the list. There are important people in our lives who are believers that we need to have a part of our lives, right? In Exodus 17, we see this interesting story when the Israelites were in a battle with the Amalekites. Verse 11, it says, As long as Moses held up the staff of God in his hands, the Israelites were winning, but whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. And when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone, they put it under, his, under him, he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. I mean, isn't that a great story of cooperation? He couldn't hold up his, uh, his own arms <laughs> to see the success that God was trying to give him. He needed help. Philippians chapter 2, Paul shares how he was encouraged by others in the faith. Starting with verse 19, it says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when, when I receive news about you. And I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. Timothy's a good guy, right? That's what he's saying. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ, but you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I... See how things go with me, and I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it's necessary to also send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. 
for he longs for all of you in his distress because you heard, the, heard that he was ill. I mean, do you see this? There's, these are conversations about people who are important in Paul's life and the life of the church. They depended on each other. They helped each other. We need each other. We need those people who will stick with us, right? Who will encourage us, who will sometimes challenge us even. We need people like this when times are tough. Overcoming faith obstacles should not be a one-person show, right? In fact, you know who else <laughs> struggled and wanted others to come alongside of him to help him? Jesus, the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26. You know the story, starting in verse 37. It says, Jesus took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. He was maybe being real and honest with his disciples, right? Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground. And he prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. <laughs> then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? I need your help, right? He asked Peter, <laughs> watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So Jesus went away a second time and he prayed, my father, if it's possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. You guys ever been in that situation before? Supposed to stay awake. I can't. So he left them and he went away once more and he prayed the third time saying the same thing. And then Jesus returned to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes the betrayer. <laughs> Do you see the struggle Jesus was having? He needed some help. He needed some comfort. He needed some strength from these guys, right? He was obviously reaching out to God. But he also needed his disciples. I mean, this story is a great example of the real need for others in our life, right? And even the fact that we sometimes let them down. I think that's true. And it also gives us an example of where you just keep reaching out. You see Jesus, even though they blew it, he kept reaching out. Would you, would you please help me, right? The story that maybe <laughs> encourages us to be better at being there for others, right, in their time of need. I mean, isn't that true? And yet, can we see the example of Jesus that it takes humility, that it takes vulnerability in order to find help, right? Too often we pretend like everything is fine until it isn't. And we can too easily hide if our relationships are as deep as the 15 minutes that we spend in between things, right? The truth is that <laughs> you can't be that vulnerable during the gre greeting time. You can say, hi, I mean, great to see you. But, but you got to go a little deeper than that, right? We must be willing to give a bit of ourselves, take a little risk, and the truth is that letting people in, it's scary, isn't it? What, what will they think of me if they find out <laughs> who I really am, right? Sometimes we think about that. Often when we're struggling, we, we feel invisible too. I mean, if they really knew me, wouldn't they reach out? But so oftentimes, we don't see the need because you're really good at looking good, right? <laughs> So oftentimes we're locking ourselves into our own isolation instead of asking for help. Vulnerability does not come easy. And I know I'm speaking to a bunch of guys here <laughs> this morning, especially for us. It's risky business, isn't it? For both parties. If we want to be known, we have to be willing to let our guard down. 
If we want to connect with people, we've got to be willing to make a move. And we can't expect people to read our minds, right? Because we're not very good mind readers. <laughs> I, I find in the church especially when, when you should be reaching out to someone, you don't know for sure if you're supposed to reach out to them because they might be offended for reaching out, but they might be offended if you don't reach out. So you're just, you're just messed up all, all sorts of directions. So might as well reach out, right? And I think in the church we have this tendency to lower the value of our fellowship events, those, those times when we get together for fun. But those are really great opportunities when we're just hanging out together to actually begin sharing life together, right? That's where sharing life happens. Don't skip the, the fun events. Don't skip the connect events. And don't miss the opportunities that you might have at those events, right? We need to be paying attention. In fact, one of the pray prayers that I pray on the way to church almost every time, it's just something that's kind of built into me at this point, is, you know, Lord, would you help me to hear and see the needs of people around me? Would you allow me to be used by you? Would you help, help me to help, help us be the church that you desire us to be, to be the people that you desire us to be? Would you? Would you help me as I enter into this time with these people? I think that's a good prayer. A strong community will be built if we can create space in our lives and in our churches to truly understand and connect with one another. It's this sort of authentic community, whether we're doing it church-wide or maybe in smaller groups, that really sustain us when we're going through our wanderings, our doubtings, our hurts. And that really is the church family that we're trusting that God would help us to be, isn't it? If you don't know already, we actually have a strategy statement here in our local church um, that literally says this. This is our strategy to provide a community, a family, for people to experience God and his grace. We don't want just any old place. We want to be a community, right? In which genuine relationships can prosper. That's really what we're about, relationships. You guys don't really come here to listen to me, so that's for sure, right? We're here for each other. But we also don't want to be just some, any kind of close-knit community either. We want to be a community in which others can experience God and specifically his grace, his love, right? That's what we're after. I mean, do you think we can live into this, God willing? I hope so. And as many of you probably already know, I, I love the Lord of the Rings, and I got to give a reference to the Lord of the Rings before I'm done with this, because you got Frodo and you got Sam, right? If you know the stories. Um, Frodo is struggling, beyond struggling, to carry this burden. And Sam, his buddy, he reaches out to his friend. And he says, I can't carry this burden for you, but you know what? I can carry you. What a moment, right? If you've seen that movie, what a moment. And that's what we're talking about, isn't it? Now, this doesn't mean that we help each other in our own strength. We need God's help in this, right? If we're ever going to help someone, it's going to have to be with the help of the Holy Spirit. Aren't we thankful for that help? Often as friends, really, if you think about it, we just can't solve all their problems. <laughs> we don't even have all the perfect answers to their questions. Really, all we can do is be there and love on them as they are, right? Right where they are, being with them, but then trusting in the grace of God to do his work, being willing to pray for them, being willing to to be there through the difficult times. I mean, we're never going to draw anyone back to the faith in our own strength. Again, the Holy Spirit works in our lives in that. Our role is to be there 
to really just help people limp back to the Lord. Not force someone to the cross, but, our, but allow our hearts to be God-focused as James lines out in his passage. We don't want to inflict more hurt, right? We just want to be there for them in this very fragile situation. And we can leave space for God to work. We love the hurting, not as a ministry opportunity, <laughs> but because we love the person, right? We just love them. Amen? So as we close out this series on reconstructing our faith, we need the church. We need to be the church. If we're struggling today, I mean, hang in there. <laughs> if you're struggling to find a helpful church family, again, why don't you start grabbing a couple people that you know that their faith is solid. Start there. Ask them <laughs> to be a part of your journey, right? Be courageous enough to reach out. And for those who, of you who are the ones that are going to be asked, you got to be ready too, right? We need to be working and growing in our own faith if we want to be used by God. Allow me to close this, this, this message with a passage from 1 Corinthians 13, beginning with verse 12. Paul says, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. As difficult as it is to accept, we just can't understand all there is to know about God. And life sometimes feels a little bit more like driving through the fog at night. You've been there before. I mean, there's moments of clarity. Sometimes we're just happy to get there. <laughs> However, we're going to get there, right? I mean, know that it's okay as we close this series up to not have a tidy faith, to not have everything figured out. It doesn't make you less spiritual. It doesn't make you like less committed. It really makes you human and maybe even honest that, <laughs> that God's bigger than you and you don't understand everything that's going on. And there's some loose ends that you just are trying to figure out. Loose ends with God, with suffering, with pain, with love, with this crazy world. And yet his love remains. Scripture is clear that when we seek him, we will find him. In some of the most unexpected places. And we remember that that even when we feel far away from him or confused, we can still see him in the face of a friend, in a sunset, <laughs> kindness of a stranger, the joy of laughter. I mean, have you experienced God in your life this week? A community of faith can help us remember that even things are murky even though things are murky in our faith, God has been faithful. One of the greatest gifts of a long-term Christian friendship is that we have one another <laughs> to bear witness to the faithfulness of God. I don't know how many times with friends that I've hung out with, one of us will say, man, I just, this just stinks. I mean, we'll be down for whatever reason or maybe down on ourselves. And the other person has the opportunity because they've been on the road with you to say, no, that's not true. I've just been faithful. Do you remember that time, that last time that God was faithful? That's, that's, that's what a long-term Christian friendship is like. When we feel hopeless, they can remind us of the faithfulness of God. They can play that highlight reel for us when, when all we can see is struggle. They love us with
with the love of God. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we are thankful for the church. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful that you are a God who loves us. You care about us. And even in times of doubt and difficulty, that you are right there with us. You never leave us. That you're there for us to reach out to. In fact, the Lord <laughs> tells us in Hebrews 12, 1, that there's a whole cloud of witnesses that are rooting for us along the journey. God, you are a God of unending love for us. Right where we are. You are so good and faithful. Lord, help us to trust in you. Help us to trust in you enough to actually even trust a body of believers, a church family, to invest in us, to reach out, to build friendships, relationships with one another, and to be there for each other, to pray for each other and encourage each other even in the hard times. So thankful, Lord, that you know us and you want us to share in the best of your plans that you have for us. And that includes the church. Thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. Thank you for your many blessings. And we give you praise for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me as we close? Our benediction passage, um, really a benediction to the series, First Peter 5, verse 6, says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. People of God, we are a blessed people, aren't we? We have this huge, good, and faithful God who's much bigger, much wiser, and we're thankful for that, aren't we? And he's always with us, even when we don't fully understand what he's doing, even when we doubt. And he can even use us in incredible ways, even in moments of doubt. As we travel the journey together, we put our hope in God who loves us and cares for us. <laughs> and God can do incredible things with us. So this week, would you lean into that love, that hope that we have in him? And let's find ways to be an encouragement to others. Shall we? May God work in your hearts as you trust in him. You are sin. There is one thing. You speak. So does he. God spoke light into existence with his words. I wonder what you could speak into existence with your words this week. I wonder what kind of love you could speak into your marriage that feels like it's in neutral. I wonder what kind of courage you could speak into the heart of a child who's hurting. I wonder what kind of peace you could speak into your broken friendship kind of hope you could speak into your own weary soul. I want you to know that the most powerful words you're going to speak this week is probably not going to be on a stage or a conference call or closing the deal with a client that you want. The most powerful words you're going to speak is probably just with one or two people listening, maybe zero. It's totally possible that the most powerful sentence you'll say this week is a thoughtful text message that you send to a friend who's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Email that you finally get the courage to send. 
Hands that whispered prayers through tears in the middle of a dark night. Powerful words aren't just for preachers who stand behind pulpits. They're for parents who stand next to bunk beds. Speak life to their kids, their spouses, who share hopes and dreams and pillow talk, not criticism, for teenagers who stand up to bullies. tongue is so small, but so powerful. Your tongue is telling a story. 